Te nā koutou kei ngā iwi kua tau mai nei ki tēnei pai kōrero, nau mai hoki mai anō kia tapatahi. Kia ora and welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. Well, coming up on today's program, the New Zealand Māori Council has conducted a survey that reveals some telling results. Results into the impact COVID-19 is having on whānau. Matthew Tukaki joins us. The Human Rights Commission says more needs to be done to put human rights and te tiriti o Waitangi at the heart of COVID-19 decision-making. Chief Human Rights Commissioner Paul Hunt joins us. And around 600,000 Kiwis have already had the flu jab this year, more than double the number of those vaccinated this time last year. Dr Sarah Shasha explains the pros and cons of the flu jab. And we have two special waiata. But first, here's what you need to know in 30 seconds. Well, it's the first day of May and day four at Alert Level 3. There is a total of 1,129 confirmed cases and 300 uh, and 347 uh, probable cases. 12 more people have recovered, which takes the total to 1,241. That means 84% of cases have now recovered. Well, to our first story, 92% of Māori are worried about their jobs and 89% can't keep up with the cost of living. Those are the sobering results of a survey conducted by the New Zealand Māori Council in the last three weeks of lockdown. It shows housing is a worry for 81% of Māori and 62% are concerned about mental health for themselves or a whānau member. With me now to discuss these figures and the way forward is New Zealand Māori Council Executive Director Matthew Tukaki. Tēnā koe, Matthew. Kia ora, good to be with you. Great uh, to be with you as well. These figures are very concerning, but are they unexpected? Well, no, they're not. I think what we've seen is uh, Māori uh, are facing a range of different social and economic issues going into uh, COVID-19, into the lockdown. Uh, we uh, know that we have high rates of inaffordability when it comes to home ownership. Uh, we know that people have been struggling with, uh, with rent. We know that they're also part um, of the low wage and low growth side of the economy. And that creates uh, a, a nasty storm that also flows into mental health and suicide prevention. Um, I mean, after all, we have now the largest or the highest rate per head of population of suicide anywhere uh, in the Western world, which is a heck of an indictment. What we're seeing, though, now is an amplification of those figures. So while they might have been a, a few percent below, in fact, they were when we last conducted the survey back in September, October last year, we've seen a, a quite a significant jump. Um, so a lot of people uh, are, are feeling not only isolated, but they have a genuine fear of the future. Um, other people are making now decisions about whether or not they buy food um, or keep the power on or pay the power bill, um, right through to many struggling with uh, keeping up with the rent. Uh, and that plays also into that fear of jobs. I mean, 40% um, of the people that were surveyed, and we believe this is going to be higher through MSD figures, 40% indicated they had already lost their job uh, or that they were taking the wage subsidy. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think what we're seeing here is nothing more than an amplification of what happened before lockdown. Uh, and the question is, where do we go from here? Uh, unemployment, for example, in the regions is stubbornly high and prolonged, long-term unemployment especially. Um, and what we can ill afford to do is have more of our whānau out of jobs for even longer periods of time, which will just create that poverty trap times two. Well, let's stick with the issue of jobs. More than a million people are on the wage subsidy and the number of people on job seeker support is up 16%. What are your concerns about the effect of these figures on Māori whānau? Well, we know that the data tells us that, let's just say, for example, the, the current unemployment rate was sitting around 6%. Uh, we know that Māori unemployment is, is traditionally a lot higher, sitting at probably about 10 to even 12%. Um, with the Treasury forecast in the worst case scenario sitting at 26% um, in, in their planning uh, about two weeks ago that was released, um, then we could consider that Māori unemployment would be above 30%. Um, so the, the challenge that we've got is it's those, those lower income and lower skills growth sort of um, jobs that are the first to go, but they're also often the last to return. And so the, the question comes down to what sort of plan do we need um, to ensure that we, we try and figure out a way of tapering those numbers off um, and then getting many people, as many people, back to work as possible. Now, Willie Jackson um, has an interesting approach to this. Um, I think it's mana and mahi. Uh, now, that is actually a really great program. So how can we scale initiatives like that up? 
How can we ensure, because I, I believe there have been no apprentices registered in the last five weeks, so how can we ensure that we sign even more apprentices up so we can take uh, advantage, I guess, of the $12 billion infrastructure fund that Shane Jones has announced? So what can we do now to prepare for the other side of Level 3 to ensure that we return as many people to work as possible um, and for those who are currently sitting unemployed, what more can we do? Uh, and, and Shane, you know, there, there were only 5,000 jobs available on seek.co.nz as of this morning or thereabouts. You know, when I, um, when I first started checking this um, five weeks ago, there were still 14,000 jobs available. So that is a significant drop um, in job availability. So what more needs to be done? You pose that question. In your view, what, what, what does need to be done in terms of more jobs? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things we can do and do now. I mean, let's let's bring back the Māori Affairs Trade Trainee Program. It doesn't need to be called that if somebody doesn't like the name anymore. Um, but the biggest investment that the government will make through stimulus right now is about training an army of tradespeople. We also know that trades attract higher wages. And also, we're going to be competing with the open market in Australia, who are also investing billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure and construction over there. And our people traditionally flow there because the wage rate is higher. So let's start the, um, the ambitious program now of getting our apprentices registered. Let's rebuild that Māori Affairs Trade Trainee Program. The next thing I would do, and do quickly, we know that there are a lot of people, uh, our people, Māori people over the age of 50, who are also sitting unemployed. And we also know that older people take longer to get back into work. So having a second career plan, a transition from something that they may have been doing to an area where there is jobs growth. I'll give you an example. For those who uh, can no longer carry bricks anymore, can no longer get under those houses and do the plumbing, um, carry glass as glaziers, um, the, uh, let's transition them into a second career around community development and social services where there is huge demand because they also bring with them a tonne of life experience. So we could re-engineer a community development certificate to get them into the role uh, that they could see through, uh, you know, to their retirement. That's another thing I would do. Another thing would be to invest further in digital uh, technologies. Uh, let's get more of our people. I mean, Chris have considered himself the digital divide between Māori and non-Māori has been laid bare. Well, let's use our now that we already have. Let's use Spectrum. Let's use all the tools that we have at our uh, in our in our little bag here uh, and invest more in uh, in creating an army of um, of digital trades, coders and programmers and software developers. Uh, and the, the final thing I would do, aside, well, actually, it's not final, I'd do a lot more, <laughs> but one of the final things um, I, would, uh, I would do is having a look at a special program to return our mums to work. Uh, so we also know that we have a significant number of wahine um, where their children are coming to the first year of school. So what more can we do to move them into the workforce as well? So in other words, we're having a look at what a national workforce development plan could look for Māori, but there's a special tinge on it and that is not going back to what we've always done. Let's invest in higher wage growth jobs. Let's invest in skills and technologies that we could only normally ever dream of because somebody else is buying that trade. Uh, and more importantly, let's uh, also grow our army of small business owners, um, not just the, the ones that are in survival mode at the moment, but let's activate a national program of um, getting more of our people into small business and entrepreneurship. That's what I would do. Matthew, you've certainly got a, a number of really good ideas. Um, and we've touched on mental health, we've touched on jobs, living costs, etc. I just want to briefly touch on housing before our time is up. The government's already put $100 million into housing, particularly the homeless, and there's not a bottomless pit of money. What more can they do? Well, well actually, the Reserve Bank has already taken action um, to help um, home affordability and ownership. Uh, so one of the things that they've done is they've taken the loan-to-value ratio rate and they've scrapped it for 12 months, which means the deposit on a house has become not 20%, but less than obviously 20%, which is good news. Um, but one of the things that we can do on home ownership is create a home ownership grant. So if you're a first home buyer, um, you know, chip in your 5% as a deposit because a lot of people can't afford to get to 20%. So save for 5% and the government matches that by a further 5% to give you a deposit of 10, um, which means that you as a first home buyer, a lot of our young people in particular and those in their middle years might finally be able to own their own home. Uh, the second thing that we need to have a look at is increasing the accommodation supplement, um, but an accommodation supplement in two ways. Um, number one, for renters to get them through the cost of living, which is experiencing growth right now. Um, but the second is for our small business owners, changing into a new supplement um, for our small business renters and commercial properties would be another thing I would do. Um, but the, the final thing, just on homelessness, 
you know, I know the government has announced $100 million. That is fantastic. Um, that's going to provide for more motel, mainly accommodation, um, post the lockdown. But that doesn't necessarily solve the underlying issue of homelessness, particularly for Māori. I mean, we're not just talking about those that we see every day that might be sleeping on a street um, or on a park bench or whatever. We're also talking about our working poor whānau, um, our people that are working. They might be doing two part-time jobs or a casual role. Um, but the reality is um, that they are living in their cars or they're couch surfing at somebody else's home. I mean, I've been to so many two-bedroom state houses out in South Auckland um, in the last 12 months to tell you that we've got sometimes up to three and four families living in a single house. Um, so it's about not saying, yes, this is the, the, uh, the silver bullet solution. More needs to be done, and that can only come by getting um, going order the housing Ministry of Housing development um, to actually speed up the process of, um, of home build. Uh, you know, it's it's not rocket science. Matthew Tukaki, a pleasure as always to talk with you this morning. Thank you so much. You've given us a lot of food for thought. Ten Sure, always good to be with you. Well, the Human Rights Commission says more needs to be done to put human rights and te tiriti o waitangi at the heart of COVID-19 decision and policy making. Chief Human Rights Commissioner Paul Hunt urged the government to reinvigorate its commitment to work in partnership with Māori as it devises and puts in place strategies for Level 3 and beyond. Uh, Paul Hunt is with me now. Te nākwe, Paul. Kia ora, Shane. Good to be with you. Thank you, and thank you again for being with us this morning. In the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, why is it important for the government to honour Te Tiriti o Waitangi and work in partnership with Māori, and not just in a lip service kind of way? Um, well, there are lots of reasons. One, one reason is that we know that effective partnership leads to effective outcomes. Um, there's data supporting that. Um, you know, Shane, I used to work at the University of Waikato before I, uh, and then I, I undertook some work in the United Nations. One of my responsibilities in the United Nations was to work as a senior human rights advisor to the Assistant Director General of WHO. And uh, she and I worked together looking at the evidence of impact of a human rights based approach in health. And um, there was a large team that we worked with, and we published something at the end of that. And what we found was, having looked at literally thousands of articles, a lot of evidence, what we found was there was evidence that if you have effective participation in health interventions, you get better outcomes. It saves lives. It improves health. Now, what we were looking at was human rights-based approach. But of course, there's a lot of overlap between a Titariti approach and a human rights-based approach. And one of the common features, Shane, is participation. Human rights requires as much community bottom-up participation as possible, and so does Teteriti. So I think that there is significant evidence now that if you have effective, effective participation, effective partnership, then that tends to lead to effective outcomes that saves lives and reduces suffering. What does effective participation look like? What does that truly mean? Uh, participation is, at one level, a great thing to have. Doesn't it also require to be involved in decision-making, making to be at the table and involved in the decisions that are being made? Absolutely, it certainly does. Look, in the report that we published just yesterday, we acknowledge that the government has done a lot of good stuff. It, it has saved lives in this response to COVID-19. It's important to recognise that. And that's, that's, we put that clearly in the report. But we also point out some shortcomings. And one of the shortcomings is that there is Teteriti and human rights, well, at least Teteriti is mentioned in the documents in, re in relation to COVID-19. And to be fair, there is some attempt to implement that. But we have the impression that neither human rights nor Teteriti have been factored adequately across the decision-making processes uh, in relation to COVID-19. So we also have some more specific uh, constructive uh, criticisms to make, for instance, around PPE, the personal protective equipment. We think that actually the government didn't get that quite right to begin with. But the larger, the larger point is that, that we found that notwithstanding the good work that has been done by government, um, there wasn't sufficient articulation and integration of, a, of Teteriti and human rights 
across the policy making table, decision making table and in implementation in communities. That's one of our findings. In terms of partnership with Māori, have you seen any positives come out of COVID-19? Yeah, there, it, it's sort of a bit perverse because COVID-19 is a disaster. It's a, we all, it's a health emergency, it's an economic emergency, it's a human rights emergency. So it's a terrible, terrible thing. However, a bit sort of weirdly and perversely, some positive things are emerging. So one positive thing is that, that, that it has underscored the critical importance of the human rights duty to communities. Now, often in the human rights context, we're talking about uh, entitlements, but actually the human rights the human rights framework does place responsibilities on individuals to do positive things about their communities. So this was one of the positive things that struck me coming out of the alert level four. There was a lot of people who were, uh, th th there was social distancing, there, th there was t taking tests, uh, there was supporting each other uh, so far as the rules permitted. There was a sense of community. This seems to me to be one of the positives. And actually, it did underscore that human rights aren't just about claiming individuals, claiming rights. They're also about individuals having responsibility to their communities. Let me mention another positive. It's actually in relation to the community protection checkpoints, uh, Shane. Look, it seems to me that this has been one of the positives emerging from uh, COVID-19. Here you, here you have, here you have um, civil defense working with councils, working with police, working with iwi, working with hapu, and together in a lawful framework, uh, offering greater protection to communities. Now, it seems to me this is a really impressive, welcome, uh, respectful form of balanced partnership. So it seems to me this is, a, this is one of the positives emerging from this calamity of COVID-19. Fascinating stuff. Paul Hunt, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We do really appreciate your time. Thank you, Shane. Kia ora. Human Rights Commissioner there, Paul Hunt. Well, there are urgent calls for the government to develop a national vaccine strategy. Amid fears, New Zealand could be at the back of the queue for any potential COVID-19 vaccine. Most infectious disease experts agree any vaccine is at best 12 to 18 months away. About 40 teams of scientists globally are working on coronavirus vaccines and some 80 vaccines are in early stage development. While the flu jab doesn't treat COVID-19, around 600,000 Kiwis have already had the flu jab this year, more than double the number of those vaccinated this time last year. Joining us now is Porirua-based GP Dr Sarah Shasha. Tēnā koe, Sarah. Thank you uh, for joining us again. You know we love you joining us. What are the pros and cons of the flu jab? Tell us. So the flu vaccination whānau is important, particularly for those of us who have chronic conditions, like issues with your lungs. If you've been a smoker all your life, you'll have issues with your lungs, asthma, diabetes, heart disease. So what the flu vaccination does is it helps to both prevent uh, getting the flu and also reduce the severity of illness. Um, and, you know, if we all got it, then it might just try and stamp out um, the flu. Uh, that's not the case, unfortunately, but it is really important that um, if you have these chronic conditions, you get the flu vaccination. Um, but also, if, you're if you want to get it and you're not eligible, you can still get it by paying for it, unfortunately, but it's still available. Um, things about the uh, flu virus, there's myths that it can make you get the flu. Well, actually, when you get the flu vaccination, Fano, it builds up your immunity. So the warriors that need to protect you inside your body, when they get going, they can make you feel a bit unwell. They can make you feel a little bit sore uh, for a couple of days afterwards. And sometimes people get a bit sore at the site. Um, but you know the advantages of having the flu vaccination are well up there, Fano. And if you can access it, then I really think that you should. Now, again, we stress this doesn't treat COVID-19 or the coronavirus. No. Are there any side effects uh, that come with the flu jab? Yes, yeah, so like, like I said before, um, 
when you do get the flu vaccination, some people can feel, get headaches maybe, they can get a bit of a sore body after after getting the flu vaccination, but that's the process of the warriors in your body building up your immunity, um, so they need to get going hard out, and so that's why it makes it feel a bit hot on the inside. You can get a bit sore at the site. Um, some people do feel like they get the flu after, uh, but there's, it's not really, a, it's not a live vaccine. So the possibility of it giving, giving you the actual flu is very unlikely. And in terms of people who have really severe reactions, minimal, minimal. We've moved into alert level three, of course, so there's a lot more movement. We're, we're seeing a lot more people uh, moving around in our communities. So a couple of questions. Should Fano wear masks when they're out in public spaces? Number one. Number two, uh, we're, we're now accessing and eating um, takeaway foods or food that's being delivered to us. Is there any risk of eating takeaway or fast food? OK, so if we go Apart back to the, the obvious, masks. of course. Uh, so if we go back to the masks, so our Ministry of Health, who is giving us all the Im information and advice about keeping ourselves safe, they're recommending that if you're in the community, you don't necessarily need to wear a mask if you're well. You do need to wear a mask if you're caring for someone who has COVID-19 and or if you're coughing and sneezing. But in that case, you might be going needing to go and get a swab anyway, Fano. Um, Fano are making masks. So this is from Haile Ngaro in Purirua. So just really important if you're making masks, um, wear them, but make sure you wash them really well. And if you're wearing a mask, then you need to think about how you're removing them. If you touch the front of your mask, then and it's got the huaketo, the virus on the front of it, and you haven't washed your hands after taking it off, then you're at risk of getting coronavirus. So it's really important if you've got the mask on that you pull it off from over your ears first. Don't touch the front and wash your hands well afterwards. Now, in terms of um, fast food causing the virus, well, yes, everybody's getting into a bit more contact now, um, but the fast food outlets have been really awesome in terms of just going drive through. Um, they're wearing gloves, they're using things to give you the kai, but there is always a risk of getting coronavirus if someone in that uh, fast food outlet has it and it gets onto a surface uh, whereby they're giving you the food with that surface. So really important again, Fano, washing our hands. But hey, why not go back to the health of eating we had before <laughs> the fast food outlets were opened again? Dr. Sarah Shasha, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Kia whanau. Professor Rangi Matamua of Tūhoi gives public lectures about Matariki and Māori astronomy. He's a stargazer by night, reading, watching and translating the messages left to us that are written in the night sky. He's been observing the changes in the sky over lockdown and has some key insights to share. Te nā koe, Rangi, no mai. Te nā koe, ho. Kia ora, what can you tell us about the changes that have occurred in the sky with the decreased air traffic and vehicle pollution? One of the things that has become apparent in the last uh, few years is the amount of um, pollution that we have added to um, the sky, not just in the way of air traffic, um, light pollution, um, emissions, and it really does impact on the quality of the sky that we see. And during this lockdown period, um, as it's gone on longer and longer, right across the world, we're noticing the decrease in, in air pollution. But just the quality of our night sky, you know, we're so fortunate here with the beautiful sky that we have in Aotearoa. Um, but the quality of the sky in terms of the clarity of the stars, the, the vibrancy and the colour um, has just been, just been amazing. So what are some of the key messages we can take away from this? Well, for me, you know, personally, I've been thinking about my own impact. You know, I'm as guilty as anyone else um, for uh, going on a whole lot of travel. Often that's not necessary. It's unnecessary. I um, have flown places just for a two-hour meeting. You know, it's it kind of it's, it's crazy, and I think it's part of um, our lifestyles, this real um, transient kind of... Um, you know, instant access kind of lifestyle that we live in. And for me, um, I think there's some lessons there that by perhaps changing what we do and realising that some of the things that we have been practising before 
lockdown aren't necessary can have a huge impact on our environment. You said earlier on that we're fortunate here in Aotearoa to have some of the most remarkable views of the night sky anywhere on the planet. Why is this? Well, there's a number of factors. Um, bearing in mind that one third of the world's population can't see the Milky Way. And think about how important the night sky and stars and astronomy is to humanity. You know, and we've blocked that for, and it's heading towards half the world's population if we continue like we are. Here in Aotearoa, we have still areas that are dark skies. They don't have a lot of light pollution um, relative to other places in the world. Um, we have some of the, the, the southern um, hemisphere has this massive ocean of um, space that is, is clear from uh, many obstructions. So we do have this wonderful sky and you'll only have to go not even too far out of Auckland, heading north, here, heading to the Coromandel, heading here into the, some other region in Waikato and even in Auckland in some places we have an amazing sky and it's visible for the vast majority of people here in this country. Of course, Matariki is ahead of us. Uh, it's a time of reflection, remembrance, as well as a time for new beginnings to plan for the year ahead. How can we observe and celebrate the Māori New Year, especially during these pretty trying times? Matariki, you know, uh, really for me is based around three things. Uh, remembering those who have passed, um, celebrating the now and looking forward to the future. And we don't have to have great big gatherings for that to happen. We can do that just as whānau. And many Māori traditionally did do that just as smaller groups. And I'm really encouraging people, you know, to reflect on, on what's happened to us in recent times. And um, I would hate, you know, and my, my biggest fear. And that's why I've put out a post the other night about the need to be aware of making change. I would hate for us just to go back to doing what we were doing before and just rushing out and driving our cars and flying everywhere. I know it's connected to the economy and there are a lot of people suffering in that regard. But just to think about the slight changes that we can make um, to maintain our beautiful skies and our environment. And of course, taking the opportunity um, to use uh, social media, uh, the internet, online uh, facilities as well, right, to come together as a whānau if we can't literally do that? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, here I am in my shirt. I've still got my pyjamas on down below. Um, you know, it just cuts down on all this time. On, on, on. It's just um, so much more efficient. And there is an element of that connection but between people that does go missing, I think, but for the most part in terms of um, good business, um, efficiency and time saving. I think this is a great medium for us to conduct what, uh, our business and what we do day to day. Kei taku tuakana rangi mā tāmua, tēnā rau atu koe. Uh, Mēnei kōrero rangatira kua puta iā koe ki a tātou i tēnei ata. Kā nui rā te mihi? Tēnā koe e hoa. Well, from one type of star to other stars, today we have three rangatahi on the show to bless us with a waiata. Shani, Kashana and Juan are all siblings <laughs> living in Manurewa and have been doing kapahaka ever since they can remember. Tēnā koutou, thank you all for joining us on the programme today. Kia ora. <laughs> so tell us, what have you been up to during the lockdown? Uh, well, because we've... We can't go anywhere, but we've um, all, like, grown habits that we wouldn't do, like, before. So, for example, we've been doing more fitness, being more active, going for walks, and, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> what, tell, tell me, what is the thing that you've most missed over the last few weeks? My. <laughs> My, yeah. <laughs> Just being able to go out, you know, going to, to work. Yeah. Yeah. So, Juan, you, you've been missing mahi? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know when you may be able to return to mahi? I, uh, next week. Next week on Monday. So you'll be looking so, forward to that, right? Yeah. Get out of here. <laughs> nice. Now, you've got the guitar. Tell us about the song that you're going to uh, sing for us today. Uh... Uh, 
we just we chose it because it was kind of uh, we just we always jam it, jam it. So we thought we'd just sing a song we all know. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to hear it. So I'll let you get on with that to jam it. <laughs> cool. cool. <laughs> Thank you, Fano. That was just beautiful. Thank you for that. What have you got planned for the rest of your day? Sleep. Schoolwork. <laughs> Sleep, schoolwork, and Juan, you'll be getting ready for Mahi on Monday, right? <laughs> Look, thanks again uh, for joining us this morning. We really do appreciate it. And thank you again for that beautiful uh, waiata. Have a great weekend. Yeah, you too. And of course, Shani, Kashana, and Juan, the Hinare Fano uh, from Manurewa. And from the Hinare Fano to the Fofo Fano, Rakai Hakeke Fofo is the son of well known music maestro Adam Fofo. Rakai is a primary school teacher at Ngati Hauwa Primary and is here with his partner, Tiaki, to Ene to Tamariki, Rere Ho, and Rayora. Tena koutou. Rayora. Tena koutou. How has lockdown been for you and the whānau? Um, we've been pretty good trying to keep our, uh, our babies occupied. Uh, um, it's been pretty cool having a newborn at home and being able to watch her grow. Um, you know, a lot of times we go to Mahi, come back, come back for Mahi, we don't have that time to spend with our tamariki because we're all too focused on um, trying to get ready for the next day. So it's been pretty pretty empowering for me as a papa staying home to watch my newborn grow um, and also spend time with my wahine. Um, I, will, I live with um, her mother. Um, so yeah, it's been good and um, been still working while, while we're at home. So yeah. But, uh, Rakai, how old is your us. newborn baby and can you introduce her to us? Yes. <laughs> Kia ora, ho, ho rai ora tēnei. E toru marama anatai. She's three months today. Beautiful. She's absolutely beautiful, just like her mum. Now, mum, tell us, how have you <laughs> been during lockdown? How, how has lockdown been for you? 
what's happening? Um, it's food choice. I love having everyone home. Oh, and I pai, pai to mahi mama, hoki. Ka pai. Now, Rākai, I hear that music is your passion. Is it something you would like to pursue full-time one day? I, um, yep, yeah, um, I've, I've always had a passion for, for singing, and um, I'm fortunate enough to have a fun and really um, involved around music and kapahaka, um, and also having uh, a good example like my father to follow. Um, it's been really, not so much easy, but um, really uh, a good pathway for me to follow. So the pathway's there for me to follow, and now just taking these opportunities as I go to, to show my, uh, my talent to the world and share it to the family. Raka, you're a primary school teacher, and um, I'm interested to know, when will you be back in the classroom? So we, um, we've advised our whānau to, to stay home during Level 3. So um, we had a uh, Teachers Only Day meeting on Tuesday uh, to discuss some of the options that we, we can provide our tamariki during Level 3. Um, and lucky enough, we only had one kid, one child come back to Kura. Um, so we're just fostering that around our staff and trying to... Um, provide money for, for that one tawira, and yeah, hopefully level two, level one, we can go back to Kura. It sounds like you've really enjoyed lockdown, but are you looking forward to going back to back to Kura, back to the classroom? I really miss my tamariki, my tawira, and, and being the rounds of uh, being present around um, tamariki that are that are learning um, off, off my lessons and, and my teachings. Um, and I'm fortunate enough to be at Akuna Aiwi, where I'm also from. So it's sort of a bonus for me that I'm giving back to my own iwi um, and also my, my little cousins and nephews um, that are coming up within the tribe. So, yes, can't wait to go back to Mahi. Now, I understand you're going to uh, share with us a medley of Māori Waiata this morning. Tell us about that, please. Um, so this medley um, we organised just last night. Um, it's just a, a medley of songs run um, well known uh, across Aotearoa, um, and then there are some also there are some songs also that are written by my tupuna uh, Wite Tohuata, who I also want to pay respects today, um, and also just a lot of waiata that our, our Maori people should know um, and will enjoy. Kapai. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, kei a koutou te wā. Kia ora whānau, he tuku mihi tēnei ki ngā kaitito o enei waiata, o ti rā kia koutou e noho rāhui nei ki te kainga. Kia ora tātou. O rahi o uweo, ara ngā tāra, ngā tāra, ngā tāra, ngā tāra. Oh, 
Kehiara mai tēnā, tēnā roa atu koutou, rākai i mui tō wehenga, i mui tō wehenga, o kōrero ki ngā whānau e mātakitaki mai ana, e whakarungo mai ana i tēnei ata ki, wā, ki wene kōrero. Heha era, heha o kōrero ki a rātou uh, i tēnei wā, i roto i te ua ua, i roto anō hoki i te koa. Uh, ka tiki ate ngā kōrero, a o taku wai ata whakamutu ngā i te whānau e ngā iwi, ki ata patahi. Stay home, stay flying, it's fine. Let's stick together um, and join together as one so that we all can get back to our normal day lives. Muri ora. Kare he kore roi tua atu i tēnā. Kei taku ranga tira, kei taku tua. Kana tēnā roa atu koe o tira koutou ko tō whānau i konā i roto i tō koutou miru miru. Kanu i rā te mihi ki a koutou. Muri ora, kakite. Piwari. Now, don't forget, Fano, we're moving to breakfast time on Monday. Tabatahi will be streaming live from 7 o'clock. We know that many of you will have become used to our 10.30 time slot. Kei te pai. Tabatahi will still be available at 10.30 on our Facebook page and on TV. On Monday, on Monday's programme, we speak with the man of the moment, Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, about everything to do with COVID-19. And we speak with strong reo advocate, Tamsin Pue, who is following the lead of her koro, the late Huirangi Waikerepuru. Well, thank you to all our guests this morning, all our whānau, and thank you for joining us. Koina a tapatahi mo tēnei rā, hei kona mo tēnei wā. Mm -hmm.